Welcome to this week's installment of Reading with Robin, your number one destination since 2002 for insightful author interviews and discussions on everything literary. And with no further introduction, your host, Robin Call. Strung out. One last hit in Other Lies That Nearly Killed Me by Erin Carr. I'm thrilled to have Erin on the show this morning. Erin is known for her writing on addiction, recovery, mental health, relationships, parenting, infertility, self-care, all of those things that are so important and I love to talk about on Reading with Robin. Also, her undying love for our Beverly Hills 90210. Her weekly advice column, Ask Erin, is published on Ravishly. She lives in New York with her husband and two sons. This is your first book. Welcome to Reading with Robin. Erin. Thank you so much. Isn't this a huge big deal? I mean, I know I was reading on your site. People can go to erincard.com. It's K-H-A-R.com. What it was like. That was one of my questions. I mean, first time writer, seeing, you know, first seeing that box of early copies and then, at, oh, yeah. you know, holding that book and imagining what that must have been like or, you know, considering the possibilities. So what was that like? It was huge. I mean, when I, you know, certainly every step of the way when I got the advanced copies last summer and then getting the finished hardcover copies was pretty emotional for me because Mm -hmm. I really was somebody that didn't think that I would live to see 30. And now here I am. I'm 46 years old. I was trying to do the math. I'm like, how old is Erin? She looks about 20. So I couldn't (laughs) really tell. Yeah. I, I, you know, I really didn't anticipate that my life would turn out this way. I didn't have much hope for myself. So the fact that not only did I survive, but I'm happily married, I'm living in New York, and I really, I'm very, not just happy in my life, but I feel satisfied with my life. Mm. You know, I always want to strive for more professionally, but I really do feel satisfied on a day-to-day basis, and that's a miracle. So yeah. it's, it's a huge deal, and, um, you know, it's been a very surreal week from having the launch, and I got reviewed in the New York Times book review. I was and just <laughs> reading that by, uh, yeah, uh, Juliet Escoria, right? Yeah. She that? that was yeah. fabulous. We actually hosted Juliet at our series, but anyway. Oh, how cool. Yeah. yeah, so, like, being in the New York Times, I mean. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. It's I mean, amazing. It's, it's the third appearance of my book. So since last summer, it's the third time my book has been in the New York Times, but this was a full review, which is a whole other thing. And I'm yes, really, it it's going to be in the print issue, not this weekend, but next weekend for um, Sunday the 8th. It'll be in the print Sunday book review. And I, it's just surreal. I, I'm, I feel extremely yeah. lucky and grateful and excited for, you know, everything else is coming. <laughs> And yeah, and who and and things you write like that, things that are coming, things you can't even imagine, and all of the people that will read this book and be so yeah. moved and and hope that they will share it and open up conversations. I mean, that's why when I got the um, information about it coming out, or maybe the galley just came out. I remember I was just immediately interested. It's a timely topic. It's, mm-hmm. it's we need you know as much as we're talking about this, we need more and more conversation. And it's strung out one last hit and other lies that nearly killed me. I'm speaking with Erin Carr. Visit her site at erincar.com. The book is just out. And click on Connect to see where Erin will be. She's, you've got upcoming appearances. And, I mean, you write this advice column, so you hear from your readers, and mm-hmm. you are going to be meeting so many people that are reading the book. And, I mean, like, I can't even imagine, you know, what that's like because you have people that are coming to talk about their own stories. Mm -hmm. But, you you know, you get that on a daily basis with all of, you know, is there anything that surprises you anymore? I mean, I'd like to say that there is, but not really. I mean, I get, you know, 60 to 75 questions a week from Ask Aaron readers. I have a pretty large readership. And, um, you know, so it's been for years people have been coming to me with, like, telling me their problems and, like, confiding in me with very personal things. And I, I imagine that that's going to increase with the book. Um, yes. I certainly, you know, as I, over the years of writing the advice column and writing more and more about my personal life and seeing how people responded to it, that was a big impetus for telling the story. You know, I realized that I could combine this love and passion I have for my professional life with writing and tell my own story there that in a way that could help people feel less alone if they're struggling and and more than that also look into addiction 
for people who've never experienced addiction, give them a look into an addiction in a way that maybe they haven't thought about it before. And the thing that's been so cool from talking to people, you know, in interviews and from early readers, so many people have told me that they really understood things that they hadn't understood before, and they, they were surprised at how much they related to in the book. And that makes me really happy because I want people to – continue to move towards looking at addiction as not a moral failing, but a public mm. health issue, and that these are human beings struggling with a very human condition. So that's sort of like the higher purpose of the book, and having that is yeah. amazing. I feel it's, really, yeah. really lucky to have this out in the world and hope that it, as you said, opens up conversations and helps people. Yeah, you know, and, and de, you know, destigmatizes all of the, you know, the shame and the mm-hmm. fear and um, all of the things that go along with this crisis. With this crisis, I mean, we're in New right. England here. I mean, it's all, it's everywhere. But and it's a very large conversation happening in New England. Always. I mean, the news story. Yes, it's a very bad in Rhode Island. That, very bad. And, very and bad. And among, yeah. Rhode Island is one of the states where youth among young women has risen by as much as 600 percent. Which is in the last staggering. Years. Yeah. And that's, is, you know, that was even more important to me because there are very few books written by women about heroin addiction. Mm-hmm. And that is a, a demographic that has really risen over the last 10 years. So I felt that this was even more important. So in so many ways, this book is uh, just an incredible gift, really, to readers. And we do have copies that we'll be giving away on Reading with Robin. Go to the Facebook page and also on my Instagram for your chance to win a copy. And, yeah, we have to, we have to talk about getting you to Rhode Island if ever there was yes. a place. And plus, your, and plus your connection. And just reading the story, I mean, you had me right at the beginning, the beginning of your, your story talks. You talked to your son as asking mm-hmm. you about, drug use. And I remember, I mean, my kids are older now, but it was always a, you know, depending on how old they are and how much information they're supposed to get, or, you know, are you, is a parent totally honest? I mean, that is a really tricky thing. You know, mm-hmm. So had, talk about, you write about it in the book, but what that felt like. And did you know that day was coming at some point that a child would ask that? I mean, I think I knew somewhere in the back of my head I knew it was coming, but when he asked it, I was surprised, and then I realized, he, you know, he was 12 at the time. I started using heroin 10 days after my 13th birthday, so in the yeah. month leading up to his 13th birthday, I really had to figure out how and when I was going to do this. Um, you know, I decided that I wanted to be honest. I felt like transparency in these situations is always the best policy. And you can do that without providing a lot of detail. So when I first told him, it was shortly before his 13th birthday. And part of that is also increasingly, not just that he was nearing the age I was, but because I write about this stuff publicly, I didn't want him to ever hear about it secondhand. So Mm -hmm. I told him I wanted to talk to him. And we sat down and I told him, gave him sort of the broad strokes of my story and told him that I had started really young and I wanted him to know that, you know, even if, even though I would never want that for him, if he ever found himself struggling with either depression or anxiety or suicidal ideation or drug use, that he could come to me and I would never, ever judge him for that. Mm -hmm. And I really wanted him to get that message. And yeah, now and he's going to be, amazing. yeah, I, mean, I think that's the most important thing. You can, I think we can be honest and do so in an age-appropriate way. Now he's almost, he'll be 17 this summer. So, you know, over the years he's asked me more questions and I've answered mm-hmm. honestly. And again, with like, you know, you don't have to go into like gruesome detail. <laughs> No, but but if you do want to read the book, it's uh, my, yeah. <laughs> my heart was just racing. I mean, the the story is so compelling and written just uh, so compulsively readable, and it is uh, it's quite a journey, you know. And it I really it was hard to put down. I mean, really had to keep knowing what was going to happen and how far would certain situations go, and you know, I want to finish that with your son though, because also. And then and talk about something else. There's so much to talk about, and I'm being mindful of the time. But the idea of of you taking at being eight, like mm-hmm. I'm just thinking as a parent, you know, where people put their medications, where you know who mm-hmm. might have access. But you know, at eight, 
I would have been thinking about, you know, I was good at swiping candy or checking out somebody's pantry. It's no different. But, I mean, mm-hmm. it's different, but it's really not. Like, but right. being aware of a child who, you know, children have all sorts of mood, you know, just really identifying anxiety mm-hmm. or depression in a child that age as a parent, you know, mm-hmm. when things are, you know, and, and depending on what else is going on, do you ever look at that and think, well, would someone have noticed or they were just, that was their personality or they, and you were able to mask it with, you know, being a great student, you were a uh, horseback, you know, you rode, you rode your horse, you were um, highly achieving and highly functioning. Right. So that's a really tricky thing. I look at it as a chi- on a child's point of view and also as mm-hmm. a parent. And yeah. right, so then there's that guilt and fear, all of that. So yeah, talk I mean, about I that. that. I think that certainly, you know, there were, it was a combination of me being really good at hiding things. And then right. my parents also, that was like an easy narrative because they were really, there was a lot going on in their personal lives. And, you know, I have a really good relationship with both of my parents now, and I feel extremely grateful for that. And, uh, both of them have expressed over and over that they wish they could go back and do things differently or that they had noticed things or whatever. I don't blame them in any way for Mm -hmm. any of what happened. I think that now as a parent, you know, of course that like scared me because I knew how much I Well, you're doing your best and then yet still, right? I mean, yeah. I think that, you know, what's important is maybe even when things seem okay, just checking in because I, I do think that, if, if we're able to intervene with any sort of mental health care early on, mm-hmm. we can save right. off a lot of issues. Um, I think, yeah. And I think yeah. that they're not always, sometimes they're really apparent and sometimes they're not. Mm-hmm. But I think it's really having a continual, clear, honest, open communication with our kids. And I do think that by sharing with them what our experiences were, you know, whatever they may be, it enables them to feel more comfortable telling us when something is going on. Right, if they're feeling off about something that they mm-hmm. know that they can come to a parent or any trusted adult or right. um, and, and not feel that shame. It, it seems that that's where much of this stems from for people and being found out. Or really, you know, and it's interesting in the book, you talk about being with different people and wanting to be seen, and yet certainly mm-hmm. as a young child, you don't want anyone to see what's going on. So it was like yeah. a very interesting back and forth. Um, mm-hmm. And just so much imagery and metaphorical and real things in reading this book. And I'm chatting with Erin Carr. Her brand new memoir is just out. It's called Strung Out, One Last Hit and Other Lies That Nearly Killed Me. And the tagline is so important. I mean, it's a very cool title, certainly. But that tagline is so important in anybody you know, just this one more, just with, you know, and then I'll stop and all of that. Mm-hmm. And, and and that's how the, the book reads. I sort of read a book like that. One more chapter and then I'll stop. Right. Not to make, <laughs> not to make anything trite. Everybody knows no, that's I'm, my MO and that's how I am. So I'm not going to dare con- compare heroin addiction no. and reading too much. I, no worries. Look, reading you have to, Robin you audience. Have to make but it you have to laugh. Yes. Yeah. I mean, listen. Some of the, my most horrid moments, like now I can talk about them and laugh sure. at some of them because right. they were ridiculous, <laughs> you know, in the moment right. they were horrible. But now, you know, it's right. that, that formula of, you know, tragedy plus time equals comedy, Absolutely. you know. It's, yeah, it so does, right. You weren't thinking in some of those moments, well, I'm going to write about this and this will be really no. funny and we'll all have a good laugh because, like you said, you didn't think you'd see your 30th birthday. and. No. That's not to minimize anything, and so that's, and many people, you know, don't, and so it's, but yeah, plus tragedy plus time equals comedy. I, I often think at the most inopportune times, this really may be funny. I have to. That's mm-hmm. just that's how I, that is how I manage. And I love this blurb from Lydia um, Yuknovich. She wrote, "I love Aaron's use of language. My air." which is how I felt my air was caught in my throat a little bit. And I knew I was in the company of a writer who is willing to take risks, knows what it's like to need to take risks, risks to get the story right, which is um, amazing. That makes what she is doing art and the whole process of writing the story and having the purpose of writing it is risky. And then being able to write it in that way and um, a fan of Lydia's. And I just, uh, you have so many, amazing quotes, Stephanie Land, all over the place. I mean, such connection 
to this story. I am really looking forward to following your journey. And for people to come see you, go to erincar.com. You're also on Twitter and Instagram. You're everywhere, and you're and yes. ask Aaron. <laughs> so you're like constantly connected. How do you disconnect, and what are some of the uh, things you do to take care of yourself, especially yeah. at such a crazy time? I'm not always good at it. <laughs> I mean, truthfully, you know, it's like that's – I'd like to say that I have, like, perfect self-care in place. I don't. You know, mm-hmm. I, I certainly – I I love nothing more than connecting with people because I spent so many years disconnecting. Yeah, And yeah. even when I was surrounded by people, I, was, I always had walls up. So I think that once I was able to start really connecting with people, I, I became addicted to that. I really – Yeah, right. I mean that – Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's nothing better than, like, speaking to someone and knowing that, that there was a connection made. And it was certainly in writing the book something that I was very conscious of, that I wanted there to be a, a, an intimate feeling between the reader and me as the narrator. And that's something I strive for in the advice column as well. So I'm not that good at at disconnecting. I mean, I certainly, there are times when on weekends where I will like just stay offline for a while Mm -hmm. or, you know, I've gone through periods of time where like, I I, like, I don't have notifications on my phone anymore. So So that's a good trick. Yeah. So you're not like (laughs) heightened every time the phone goes, I know that could be. Oh my gosh. Right. So, and so, actually, I have to turn my Twitter notifications are on now. I need to turn them back off. <laughs> Turning my notifications off really helps because then it's like I might check in every couple of hours, but I'm not every five minutes. <laughs> bing, bing, bing. Exactly, <laughs> because that's people. part of that, you know, when when you have that tendency, it becomes mm-hmm. something else. I mean, how do you – I mean, well – I don't know. I'm trying to think of how to use my time most wisely. And it's oh. very tricky because this could be like I could talk. There are some topics, and I do a lot of fiction on reading with Robin, mm-hmm. and I love nonfiction, especially mm-hmm. memoir. And when there are topics that are I feel deeply connected to, it's even more. Um, it's even more. So, um, well, so talk about how, well, let's talk about because this is reading with Robin, and people want to know how I sort of laid out the story and decided which parts of the the years to um you know spend more time in and to keep the story moving and and what it was like you know really to sit down and just you know highlight all the different um situations and and do, then do you go down sort of the rabbit hole of oh my goodness I hadn't thought about this in so long and which parts keep the story moving how did mm-hmm. you do what was that like well, for you so when I signed with my agents, I had uh, I had some chapters written. I didn't have the book completed. Mm-hmm. I knew what I wanted to write. I wasn't entirely sure of the structure. Before I um, signed my deal with Park Row, I had put together a proposal with the help of my agents so that I had a very clear narrative arc of the story and that each chapter had its own narrative arc. Right. Once I had that down, it was very easy for me to kind of go in and say, okay, which moments do I want to zoom in on that mm-hmm. are going to make that narrative arc happen in each chapter? And that's kind of how I approached it. And then from there, it was it was actually writing, right, mapping it out was really difficult. <laughs> but once it was yeah. mapped out, when I sat down to write the rest of the book, it actually came out fairly quickly um, because I had such a strong – um, map for what I was going to do. And I think that that was sort of, you know, the intention was because I was covering, you know, memoir is obviously not an autobiography. It's like a slice of life, but I was covering a pretty large swath of time. I yeah. wanted to make sure that I could move the narrative forward quickly in a lot of places and then know exactly which moments I wanted to zoom back at. And then in the editing process, you know, there were a few moments that were taken away and some moments mm-hmm. expanded on. But, um, yeah, that's basically how I sort of dealt with <laughs> covering so much. Yeah, it's a lot. It is. It's a lot of years. And it, right. And, and uh, there's such a craft to writing memoir, keeping the reader engaged. Right. And keeping the, the you know, the essence. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Keeping the reader, turning the pages, and that essence of the story and, you know, getting that right. And then thinking about all of the people who had come in and out of your life. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. during that time period and so have you heard from some of these people or is I, there somebody yeah, like you I mean, hope I, you don't sort of hear from or like how's that go? There are people I don't speak to I mean there you know certainly a lot of the people in the book the major players most of them are in my life now 
Mm-hmm. And what was cool, so I had kept journals, like, fastidiously from the age of seven. And oh, wow. then I also had years, you know, in the 90s where I was writing letters back and forth with my best friend and recording these audio cassettes. Yes, so that's we, so cool. She and I both kept all of them. So wow. It was such a yeah. gift when writing this. I even included some of the letters in one of the chapters yeah. because it was like I, I recorded conversations I had. With you were ahead. Of, you were ahead of you. You were definitely ahead of the curve on that kind of stuff, right? I can't believe I did Let's that. Let's just go to the primary source and see what exactly. I had to say about that. I know that's very. Yeah. That is very cool. Um, it was really yeah. cool and helpful. And then a lot of people, you know, even people that I'm not close to, I got back in contact with a few people because I, if I was that's unclear neat. on the events of something, I was able to ask them like, am I correct in my memory of this? And obviously, you know. There's always going to be somebody that has a difference about how they viewed the event because we're course, looking at, right. even in the way I recorded them in those primary sources, it was Amazing. still through my lens. Yeah, of you course. Know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but they were very helpful. <laughs> that's great. And that's and that becomes another way to heal, you know, part of a relationship. Mm-hmm. We're talking about it and having some perspective of time and and the way that you look at something you know and this book Mm -hmm. is just i can't recommend it highly enough and it's such a great book to give to people and to share and have conversations and pick this one for your book club i am i've been talking a lot about this on reading with robin and strongly encouraging conversations about you know things that are happening and picking Mm -hmm. nonfiction. and i think that is um you know something book clubs certainly don't take i mean there are certain ones that are there are nonfiction book clubs in that, but I mean, like ladies, you, the ones that are reading every historical fiction, World War II, look out there, pick this one, pick Strung Out, One Last Hit and Other Lies That Nearly Killed Me, erincard.com, and visit her site for all sorts of great news about this book. You'll be seeing it everywhere. I'm so excited to be able to share it. There are so many questions I will ask, but I, maybe I'll send you an Ask Erin. Dear Ask Erin, yes. <laughs> I, I, I feel a little bit like I have more things to talk about you with, so I'm going to send you a question. There's probably one you haven't gotten from a talk show host who wants to get more in-depth exactly. with a book <laughs> another time. And I hope that we'll get to have you here in Rhode Island. I would love, I would love to that. be able to figure something out, yeah, especially with all of the people here um, and the situations. And are you hearing from from young people um is the book getting into the hands of young people i know it's just out but is that a few, yeah a few, i mean i yeah. definitely already with my advice column i surprisingly have a yeah. quite young audience for my advice column so i get questions frequently i mean i get a lot of questions about other things too but i do get a lot of questions about addiction um and i think that you know i've I certainly had messages also from parents who have children that are struggling with addiction. I've had several messages in the last week from parents, um, you know, that have messaged me on social media that may have a child who's in treatment or a child who's struggling or a child who's been through treatment. And that's been um, really good, too, because I think that I have the perspective as a parent now, but then also having been a young teen that was struggling. Yeah, I think that is an amazing combination and being able to share that story and, like you said earlier, really connecting with people. And, I, you know, the earlier the better and having these discussions mm-hmm. is, is what we, you know, that's one of the hopes, you know, and, and this book is obviously so hopeful because uh, here you are talking about this. So yeah. <laughs> I, um, I'm, I'm really glad that we got a chance to talk. What are some of your, like you're going on a trip, what are you packing? Do you pack books to read or are you doing you know, what are, I know this is a big sure. focus now, but like, you know, something that you enjoyed reading or a favorite book, memoir, or otherwise of yours? So, I mean, memoir-wise, certainly Lydia Yuknovich's chronology of water, like, yeah. changed what I thought was possible with writing. <laughs> Amazing, <laughs> and, you know, yeah. In fact, some of the chapters were written in workshop with her, and she really taught me how to write from the body, which mm-hmm. is an important thing when you're writing something where there's so much, like, sense, sense memory. Um, so I'm always grateful for that. I'm taking with me – I'm have. i currently listening to Lori Gottlieb's Maybe You Should Talk ah, to Someone on audio. Isn't that great? It's I great. love it's that. Really yes. And I was I, thinking of her, yeah. My The book that I'm taking to read is um, – Louise Penny's The Cruelest Month, which is the oh, third. Oh, joy. <laughs> yeah, what a treat. Series. 
Yeah, which I just discovered like early last year. So I'm really excited. I like sort of, I really love her, her writing. They're really good escape, escape reading there. <laughs> you got to do Great. that. And also you're heading out on tour. And so you'll be in bookstores and people will be thrusting books your way and she so winds <laughs> up with more. But it is such a great escape, a treat. And this book is all of those things. It's strung out. One Last Hit and Other Lies That Nearly Killed Me by Aaron Carr. I wish you fabulous tour. Please keep in touch and all the well, best. And, and for more information, Aaron, I know I'm so excited, AaronCarr.com. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in to this week's installment of the Reading with Robin podcast. As always, our full-length podcasts will be available right here on robincall.com. We appreciate your support and look forward to having you over next week when we chat with our next featured guest. Have a great week and happy reading.